That's something that governments have always engaged in. We're on the march. The Empire's on the run. Alex Jones and the GCN Radio Network. Introducing Pro One. All of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics advanced media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It is the only one that does it and out of the gate. We have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia, and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. Get your Pro Pure with a new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888-253-3139. Hi folks, Alex Jones here with some important information. I want to tell you about Matt Redhawk and his team of patriots over at My Patriot Supply. Several years ago, Matt was sitting in his two-bedroom apartment, frustrated with the direction this country was headed, and the charlatans willing to sell us out for a quick buck. Deciding to take action, a company run by Patriots for Patriots was born. My Patriot Supply has never taken a loan or accepted outside funding. They now operate two distribution facilities and employ over 50 hardworking American men and women. It is rare to find companies who practice what they preach. And that's why I stock my pantry with high-quality storable foods from My Patriot Supply. Go to MyPatriotSupply.com forward slash Alex today for special offers on emergency food storage or call their preparedness specialist at 866-229-0927. That's 866-229-0927. Do business with someone who shares your values. MyPatriotSupply.com slash Alex. The globalist social engineers are not just targeting us with propaganda. They are manipulating our genetics. We are being targeted at every level by estrogen mimickers that lower our testosterone and other hormones and natural compounds that the body needs. After consulting top doctors, nutritionists, pharmacists, and others, we have developed what I believe is the ultimate non-GMO organic super male vitality formula sourced from powerful organic herbs and then concentrated for maximum potency super male vitality was developed to activate your body's own natural processes instead of using synthetic chemicals super male vitality by infowars life is so powerful that i only take half the recommended dose for a limited time we are offering 15 percent off super male vitality at infowarslife.com to introduce you to this powerful supplement visit infowarslife.com today to secure your super male vitality infowarslife.com there is a war it's happening now it will decide the fate of humanity the time to choose sides has come. We are the resistance. We are the info war. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex on this Monday, March 3rd, 2014. And I have Paul Joseph Watson on the phone from the UK. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of wars going on right now. We've got Obama conducting a war on the economy with Obamacare. We also have a war on children that is developing a war on family, and we're going to be talking to Paul Joseph Watson about that. We're also going to be talking to him about the real war that is on the brink that's going on in the Ukraine that is building up as a civil war in the Ukraine and the Crimea. Is that going to expand into a wider war? Is that going to get NATO and the U.S. involved? They're playing a very dangerous game of brinksmanship. And later on in the program, we're going to be talking to... Kathleen Willey, one of the women that Bill Clinton, that accused Bill Clinton of sexually assaulting her. And she's going to be talking about what she perceives as the real war on women. So stay tuned for that. But right now, let's talk to Paul Joseph Watson about what he thinks about this war that is actually a real war. We have all these metaphorical wars, Paul. 
But we've got a war that is coming up right to the edge. NATO is warning that Russia is risking Europe's peace and security. I don't know. I think uh, NATO has some involvement in that too, don't you? Well, now we've got over the past hour or so, David, this deadline that Russia has imposed on Ukrainian forces in Crimea. And they're basically saying that by 3 a.m. UK time, which is 9 a.m. where you are, Ukrainian uh, army in Crimea have to basically surrender and give up all their military bases so that Russian troops can take them over. Otherwise, they're going to take them by force. Mm. So this is really the biggest escalation we've seen so far in this conflict. Now that Putin has slapped a, a time deadline on Ukrainian forces in Crimea to surrender, uh, which suggests that this could indeed go hot within the next 12 hours or so if those forces in Crimea don't surrender. Well, you know, clearly it's taken them by surprise, taking the Obama administration and John Kerry and others by surprise. We talked to Joel Scowls, and I thought he made a very good point last week. He expected that Putin would wait a while. He thought that because of the publicity and the press and the Western press that's being used, he thought that Putin would wait, uh, let some things happen in Crimea, try to make a case that he had to come in to protect the minorities in the Crimea, and uh, that, that he basically would kind of wait so that he would have a PR game to play. But Putin is not waiting for that. He basically doesn't really care what Clinton or what, what Kerry or what Obama or what the West or NATO thinks. He's going to act in what he perceives to be his best interest, apparently. Well, I mean, that's right. He's calling their bluff, isn't he? Yeah. We saw a lot of criticism for Obama over his weak statements. Yeah. Kerry came out with some stronger statements about economic sanctions. But again, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So Putin knows there's going to be no military backlash, even if he does go ahead, most likely, with this attempt to seize the Ukrainian bases that haven't already been given up or surrendered. Because, of course, we had reports a couple of days ago about how many of the Ukrainian forces were already surrendering because, of course, Crimea is now almost exclusively run by pro-Russian forces or, in fact, Russian troops occupying the entire region. But the um, the interview with Skousen was interesting because, of course, he posited the notion that this entire revolution from the very beginning was started by Putin himself, was mm -hmm. a kind of a long game that he was playing. I tend to disagree with that still because further revelations have emerged about who funded the initial protests that led to this overthrow of the democratically elected government of Ukraine back in November. And these emerged just a couple of days ago, and the documents which have been released quite clearly reveal that the U.S. State Department, under U.S. aid, provided more than half of the budget for one of the main protest groups, the NGOs that was involved right at the beginning of this uprising, and it was called Center UA, which under the umbrella of that NGO has numerous other organizations, including Chesno and Stop Censorship. So these governments have emerged confirming that the State Department under USAID provided the majority of their budget for 2012, and that the goal, according to this character called Ole Rybachuk, who's kind of the leader of that umbrella group of NGOs, said was to well, he said, we want to do the Orange Revolution again, and we think we will. Now, he was involved in the 2004 Orange Revolution. He said, we now have 150 NGOs in all the major cities. This was a few months ago, right, mm -hmm. when the protest started. So he's the head of that umbrella organization that was prov provably funded by the State Department right at the inception of the protest. So this is bombshell revelation evidence that it was completely contrived from the very beginning again at around the same time that victoria newland went to ukraine and said oh, yeah. the u.s has invested five billion for the same goal and, and she makes this phone call on an unsecured line to the ukrainian ambassador and pretends that she's astonished when it's heard and and commented on by the by the russians i just feel sorry for the ukrainian people one of the things that skousen said was 
that uh, he believed that there was a genuine pushback on the, of the people of the street. I think they're being used. They see the corruption of both sides. And, of course, after the Orange Revolution, the guy that got put in charge was a former central banker. And there's an article from The New American today says the Ukraine is the new interim government has too many familiar faces. I'm reminded of the song by The Who. Uh, we won't be fooled again. You know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. They're talking about how these guys are being put in are a lot of the same old oligarchs. And these are people who were related to Yanukovych and others who are now getting, you know, 50% of the state contracts. They're uh, some of the richest billionaires in the world. These are the people that they're seeing on both sides. It doesn't seem to matter whether it's the Russian puppets or the Western bank puppets that get put in. The bottom line is the poor people of the Ukraine are seeing nothing but despotism and corruption in the government no matter which way it goes. And so, yeah, part of, part of what uh, Skousen said, and I, I agreed with this part of it definitely, was that they were they they the, the Russians saw a a very real reaction frustration. Obviously, you can't get that many people to show up in the streets unless they're truly frustrated about something. But I I do believe that they're being they're being used by both of these groups. They're being used by people who are corrupt oligarchs that have taken the place of the Russians, and and that's what we see happening now. Same people coming back into the new government. Well, of course, the, the Prime Minister Yatsen Yuk was hand-selected by Newland in that leaked phone conversation, so yes. he's been put into power already. Yes. But a, a, an aspect of it that's not been focused on, not just by the mainstream media, but by anyone, is the energy aspect of this, because you had Chevron and Exxon who were deeply involved in fracking, natural gas drilling, over the last couple of years in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. Now, Gazprom, which of course is the Russian-controlled monopoly corporation, the Russian government owns a majority share in it, basically has a monopoly on natural gas provided to Europe. So as I document in the article, trade war Gazprom threatens to disrupt gas supplies to Europe, which today they've come out and threatened that the political turmoil could cause gas supply shortages, shortages to Europe, which of course means higher prices. As I warned Last week, when I said with the IMF taking over, you're going to see see a Greece-style ratcheting up of austerity fascism. Now that's admitted that gas prices are going to go up for Ukrainian citizens. So, as you said, they're not going to benefit at all from this. And that um, frontier of the energy aspect of this is looking like it could blow up into a trade war because yeah. Gazprom fears that NATO and the U.S. through corporations like Chevron and Exxon could take over their monopoly in Europe over that natural gas. So that's a major aspect of it that's been ignored. Well, you know, exactly. You've got a possibility of a trade war erupting, and that would benefit some economic uh, interests that are very well connected with the American government. You've also got the possibility of a new Cold War, which everybody is talking about right now. If we foment revolution right at the doorstep of Russia... Some people would say within Russia, depending on your perspective. If we permit that, that's going to lead to a new Cold War. And, of course, that's going to benefit the military-industrial complex. They lost that huge profit center back in 1989 when no one could see the, the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation. They couldn't see them as a credible threat to us anymore. They had to invent the threat of terrorism. And now, of course, they've got a whole new profit center, and that is the police state industrial complex that they're gearing up for here domestically. But they still want these foreign wars, and they would just dearly love to have another Cold War with Russia because that would bring in a whole new spectrum of weapons that they could sell to the U.S. military. So from both a new Cold War as well as a new trade war, there's a lot of, of justification from their perspective, something that they would benefit from if the uh, the, the uh corporations and the State Department get their way, but it's a very, very dangerous brinksmanship because this could very easily get out of their control and become a real war, couldn't it? Well, that, that's the fear, definitely, but I would argue that we've already been in a, in a kind of proxy Cold War since mm -hmm. the Obama administration announced that it would pivot towards Asia, and since that point, both China and Russia have been building up militarily on a massive scale coming out with aggressive war rhetoric. And as you said, because of the threat of terrorism is seemingly fading in their ability to sell it to the American people as a genuine threat, you will notice that in China, when they had a, a knife attack over the weekend, 
the state media downplayed it mm-hmm. in, as opposed to the US media after every single terror attack they hype it beyond all reasonable expectation because they profit from it through the military industrial complex but I think we're already in that cold war phase and that the US is now going to seek just 